Hey everybody, Jessica at Pretty Prints and Paper, and I want to share with you my top planning and productivity tips. These are things that have worked for me, and I know that I have spent a long time trying to figure out what are the things that work best for the way my brain works, and it's not always what works for everybody else. So take what is useful, leave what isn't, and let's get started. First, the most useful thing is to know your why. For me, I am a Myers-Briggs ENFJ, the NF meaning that I always want to know the deep purpose of something in order for me to make order of the rest of it. So I don't always resonate with making a five-year goal plan. I don't have concrete, like I want to run a marathon in Disneyland. That's not really the way I work. So in order for me to have a sense of where I'm going, I like to have an overview of some of the main things that I want my life to be like. So these are less tangible, but, but my guiding star as I make plans for the future and decide on my next steps. Next, understand your life's rhythms and plan around it. So I like to get a sense of what my year looks like from a couple different standpoints. I like to know what my workflow is. I want to know what the major events and anchors of the year are for me in my personal life, perhaps even the flow of where my money is supposed to be going throughout the year, so that I have a sense of these are the big rocks that are anchoring my year and then everything else kind of plans around that. So for example, this is my workflow. I do something similar to understand my personal life 2021 looks a little bit different because it's uh restrictions so we don't really know everything that's about to happen so that one is a little bit more tbd but then when i am able to take things like this and i can aggregate it into something that i call a time chart so a time chart is where I have, you know, some sort of time at the top. This could be the full year. This could be the next six months, whatever you want to do. And then on the left, I have my work responsibilities. And down here, I have my personal life stuff. And I've gone through and I've marked the cycle of each of those things. They're not in full force all year round. So it helps me to kind of identify when those heavy periods are and maybe when I'm not even working on those things at all. For example, I'm a curriculum writer and do a lot of things in the end of the year to make sure that it wraps up okay. I do a lot of curriculum writing that's heavy in the middle of the summer at, to get prepared and then at the end of the semester. So knowing that cycle layered on top of all the other responsibilities, I can kind of see, wow, May in June are going to suck. Look at all these solid colored lines. Being able to look at this tells me when I might want to schedule something. So someone's asking me to do a workshop. I can kind of think through this cycle and understand that February is probably a better time. I'm not going to feel as stressed out as if I'm going to plan it out in April. So understanding that helps me create a better pace of life for myself. I'm just using the passion planner markers to highlight because I love the way the colors work. They're light and I already know it's a cohesive rain rainbow pattern. So number three, knowing that self-care is systemic. Each of us has roles and commitments that we each play in our lives and the Eisenhower method of prioritizing the most important and urgent, that's fine, but you're just kind of shuffling around your tasks. And really the most meaningful things that I can do is look at what are the responsibilities that are big enough to put on here and what is still necessary. So the only meaningful way that I can control my pace is deciding what roles that I'm agreeing to. So for example, someone asked me to be a chair of a committee and thinking through like, wow, there are some total costs to taking on that role and I need to decide very, very carefully if I'm going to say yes to that. And in the moment, it felt like I was disappointing him by saying no, but understanding that with the ebbs and flows of the rest of the things that I was doing, I'm sure that I could have made it work. I could have gotten more efficient, but what's better than being efficient at a long list of things is to minimize the list to begin with. I think about that with curriculum writing and assignments for students. I know that the biggest way to impact students' self-care is to just remove what is unnecessary and trying to apply that in my own life. So one of the most important productivity frameworks that I use is actually called the focus funnel. And like I was saying, the Eisenhower method, that familiar two by two grid of the most important and urgent tasks is really limited because you're still shuffling around the same number of things on your to-do list. Focus funnel allowed me to think about tasks in a different way, where when each of them comes in through the top, you first try to eliminate the task. Is it something that I actually have to do? Um, and then if it makes it past that, then you know, maybe I can automate this. 
And again, this kind of takes time on the front end to think about the best way to automate something or set it up. But the process of that buys you time later. And that's the whole goal of the focus funnel is being able to multiply your time. If you can't do that, can you delegate? Are you really the only person that can do this particular task or can somebody else take it up? And so you can, you know, buy back your own time by delegating it off. This also can take a lot of time at the front end because you're training someone to do it. But in the future, having that off my plate has given me back so much more time and effectiveness. If it goes through that filter and you know that you have to do it, you can either concentrate and do it now because it's time sensitive, or if you know that you have to do it, but it's due later, you can do what he calls procrastinating on purpose. And that is my favorite thing. I will snooze that email to return back at a different time. If a student wants me to write a recommendation letter, I forward that back to myself at a later time, closer to the deadline and procrastinate, get it off my plate for now. So I can focus and concentrate on the things that are due in the near future. So this is honestly one of the things that runs in the background of my mind all the time and has helped me multiply my time and energy. Speaking of energy, the other planning tip that I have is to follow your particular energy. I did a video about this earlier, so check that out. But I wanted to map where my natural tendency for energy lies. I already kind of had an intuition about this because I am a night owl. But being able to chart this throughout the day in the background was super, super telling because I could see that every day there's a crash and every night my, my energy rises. And studying that throughout the weeks is allowing me to better plan for certain tasks when my energy has the most to give and I can be contributing the best that I can. So I think about planning certain tasks, like if I need to do deep grading or lesson planning, I'm going to try and do that in the, in the afternoon and not the morning. The morning, I'm just not in it to win it in my mind. So I'll plan for physical tasks like tidying and certain things in the morning to get me going or maybe check-ins with people or conversations and that wakes me up enough to be able to use this high energy time for other things. Another thing that I'll try to do is I automatically kind of time block. So on Tuesdays and Thursdays, that's when I teach my class. And so I try to focus Tuesdays and Thursdays just on teaching related stuff because it does cost you time and efficiency switching from thing to thing in terms of categories. So I try to schedule a lot of my teaching stuff Tuesday, Thursday, meetings and project work on Monday, Wednesday, and then other committees or meetings that I'm on, I try to have on Fridays. Obviously, that doesn't always work. People have to find time when it works. But in my ideal world, I aim for that. The next is working it out on paper. Something that has been really obvious for me is that the process of writing things down is the work. And even just having done the process of writing something down or creating a spread, that already has the benefit of me thinking through something more clearly. I have a lot of thoughts that are jumbled in my mind. And like my therapist, the paper helps me pull those things apart and categorize them in a way that makes more sense and I can then act on that. So I love these pads from cloth and paper. I also use of course the next blank sheet in my bullet journal but being able to just throw things down, chart things out, really helps me be able to organize some of those thoughts that are running rampant in my head. It also allows me to visualize like the upcoming months and what I need to spend my time on and drawing that out forces my brain to slow down and pull it apart. You don't have to only put the finished version in your bullet journal. You can actually use the paper and the pen to work out the thoughts and make those things clearer. The next thing that I think has been super important for me is using digital when it makes sense. I grew up in the age of Google Calendar. I've always put all my events in there and I am not going to try and be some purist and write things down in my planner when really I just check my phone, check my app to see where I'm supposed to go, especially now with Zoom calls and links to relevant documents. It's just more sensical with how often things change to put those things in digital. I don't do all of my budgeting in my planner either. I use YNAB in order to keep track of all my transactions in real time. I don't try to force something onto paper when there's an app that I would rather use. So being able to understand that has freed me up to being able to use paper when I need it 
in digital when I need it. Especially because I work on a very collaborative team, any document or any notes that I take that has to be shared with others, require editing from others, or is really complex, I do on Google Drive and share with the relevant people. And if I have to work out my own thoughts on it, I can map it out on a piece of paper in my journal or I can, you know, do a brain dump really fast on Google Docs. But I'm not going to try and force myself to be like, oh, I'm going to be a bad bullet journaler if I have to use an app in order to do something. That's not the point. These are all tools that help you do whatever it is that you need to do. So on the Enneagram, I am a two wing three, which means I'm a helper with a wing of an achiever. That means that saying no is very hard for me. And over the years, I have gotten better at navigating this and helping other people navigate it with me. These are some of the phrases that I've learned to use in order to manage not only my energy, but also the quality of whatever someone is asking of me. Some of the questions that I raise um, honestly help other people figure out what, what exactly they're asking. So things like, when do you need that by? What else have you tried or are you planning to try? What is the budget? This is a really common one for um, when people ask me to do workshops because I used to do them all the time and I got kind of burnt out. So just asking the full scope of like, what is the budget so I can make a best decision for myself? What is your vision for this? Because I want to understand the whole picture before I say yes or no. If I am busy, being able to say, can I be involved with this phase later on? You know, we often think of collaboration as like you get sucked in at the beginning and then you're there the whole time. But I think being smart about the timeline of a project and being able to say like, there's these different ways that you can be involved and that helps other people say yes or no to the parts that they are able to commit to and do a good job. I'm focused on this right now. If you still need help like next week, next month, I can certainly jump in. If you're working on multiple competing things, sometimes people just don't know that these are all the things that you're working on. So asking the question, what should be the priority then? Should I focus on this or should I switch gears and work on this other thing? I think that helps people get some clarity about what kinds of resources that they have or don't. If people are asking you to hang out and you just don't want to, <laughs> I've gotten a lot better at just saying, oh, I'm good. I'll see you next time. Or invite me next time, because if you have plans for yourself, don't feel bad about saying that. Your friends will hopefully still invite you next time. And again, like asking, what does this all entail? I think even asking these questions at first was challenging because people were not expecting that from me, especially if you're somebody who has said yes a lot in the past and have gotten back to their emails really quickly with a affirmative yes right away. These questions can even be difficult to start off with because people aren't expecting you to have any kind of pushback or even a pause to consider. One that's not on here is I can check my calendar and I'll get back to you. Giving yourself some time to be able to formulate a better thought in response is also really helpful. But over time, I think people will come to respect and understand what it is that you're trying to do and that they themselves are also trying to get a better understanding about what it is they're asking, especially when it comes to projects. And getting that clarity gets everybody on the same page. No one is going to resent someone later because you've tried to put those things up front before anybody has committed. If you're in a position of asking somebody to do something, please keep those things in mind and make it easy for someone to make an educated decision about whether to say yes or no. At the end of the day, what I have learned over five years of really intently planning is that I spent a lot of time fighting myself and what it is that I naturally want to do with my planning. When you see a lot of the examples that are out there of people who are really at peace with their system and what it is they do each week, each day, in the morning, at night, you think that's the way to be a successful planner and that's how I'm going to get organized and productive. And over the years, I have learned that there are things I already kind of know about myself, but I've resisted thinking that that's not the way you're supposed to do this. And that's one of the reasons why I started bullet journaling to begin with, because it offers you the freedom to create the structures that work the best for your brain and validating that and running and leaning into it because that's how you're going to be most effective is if you lean into your preferences and not try to spend a lot of energy fighting against them. So thinking about where you find friction, how do you reduce that? What are the things you need to make peace with and be honest with yourself about how many of those clear little dots stickers that I have bought and have never really 
used. I'm not going to be a minimal planner. I'm not going to be somebody who does doodles or I'm not going to be somebody who needs to track my like every habit of every day. I'm not going to keep doing that. I'm not going to force myself to have strict routines. That's not going to be the way that I will be successful. And I'm going to be okay with that. Figuring out your own way is really challenging because no one else is modeling it for you all the time. And you have to be confident in the ways that you want to do it and know that it is valid. You can change it tomorrow and it's just for you. You and your purpose, you and what you want to accomplish. It's not for Instagram. It's not for other people. Um, not for me, that's for sure. So think about what it is that you need to do to make peace with your style of planning and run with it. That's all I got for you today. If you have questions or things that work for you or you realize work differently, I would love to hear them down below. Sometimes we just don't know that the other ways are possible until someone else says it out loud and we feel less alone and a little bit more validated. Leave a comment down below. If you like this video, share, subscribe comment, whatever. I just hope that you enjoy it. I'll see you in my next video. Bye.